7 tonight, your time, uh, Jay, so we can get to it. Not a problem. Whew. So, yeah, it was kind of fun last night. Uh, we, we didn't have the huge viewer peak. Um, you know, it was you know, one of those typical, like, ebb and flow, but, oh my gosh, we had 9,000 bits last night, Jay. You're welcome. Uh, we had, yeah, I know. It was crazy. <laughs> I told, see, uh, everyone, the, the, the audience loves shows that they can participate directly in the, 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 the effect of the game. And uh, that is uh, that just uh, gave uh, Gimbal all the love he needed to know about, right? So mm -hmm. that was awesome. No, and that, and you were... you the subs and everything like that, too. No, you were so right. And that was really, I think, a, a great example of where I've got to overcome... i got to get in my own head. You know, I was so yeah. worried about people feeling like I was trying to pull money out of them uh, in some way. And they really want to participate. And your encouragement to let them do that, it exploded. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, and, and it was just, you know... And, and it's something you don't know, go a little well every time someone passes like that, but... But uh, and a special opportunity like that, which it was, that was the perfect uh, moment to, to do it. Like, you know, special events all the time, mm -hmm. you know, something like that during Grail Con, I mean, you push it, you know, because people uh, people want to participate in those. That's why we highlight their streams, because people really want to watch, not only watch, but get a feel for the game, too. No. So, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. All right, here, let me hit mine up here. I got to do this. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> What are you laughing about, Vivi? Bloodwild and his his dinosaurs. <laughs> oh, Bloodwild, stop it! The dinosaurs, no! I I told you I don't like them. He reacts to all of the stuff. In I know. The chat with, in Discord with dinosaurs, and it makes me laugh. Every time. It, it, he's lucky. He's lucky. I like him so much, and he's been so helpful to us because I get upset about him. <laughs> Uh, it's uh yeah I don't know it's a weird thing for me I just I've never liked mixing dinosaurs into my D and D it feels like a real sort of misalignment of genre. Hey Lord Fourth, uh, we're getting all the trays out. We got a lot of stuff to ship out. Um, my shipping department, aka my wife, uh, took a few days on vacation last week to go help her friend uh, move their daughter into college, and so uh, I'm a bit behind on shipping, but we'll definitely get it out. My apologies for not pushing uh, this more, too. I just was like, I got, you know, work, all that. I, I should hey, have, no. I should, have, I should have asked you earlier. You know, you're, <laughs> a, 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 you're, a, a, you're preaching to the choir, and B, that just means when I get back from my vacation in mid-September, you're going to have to come back again. Yeah, uh, so we'll, we'll figure the timing, out. The timing works very well. The timing yeah, absolutely works very well. This is a good topic, too. Show, us, show everyone the little differences and nuances. Exactly. All right. So let me kick off our uh, GHA vid just for fun because I love it so much. Yeah. And then we're going to go to our Dragon Crafting Guild ad. We're going to talk about our sponsors for about 30 seconds and we're going to jump right into it. We're so excited to have uh, Jay Scott, Lord Gazumba, uh, with us tonight. Um, and we're going to be talking about some fun and maybe even some slightly controversial topics with additions. <laughs> Edition Wars. Wonderful. Edition Wars. We'll try to keep it away from that, but there may be a bit of it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to goad you into some of that, Jay. So, <laughs> I don't think it'll be hard. <laughs> Is it me, or does, this is a Twitch complaint, everyone. Does the auto host never work when you want it to, but then it always works when you don't? Yeah, like, I, I have no... Hey, Lord Forth, uh, Kiegia, Mayamorph, good to see you. Ridiculous, good to see you. Dorgrim, man, it's been a minute, good to see you as well. And, uh, yeah, thank you for all the great chat last night and all the participation, the subs, the bits. Um, everything just continues to hum along here and we're excited about it so thanks for being with us tonight oh cold steel penguin yes Doraka I, I've, I've mentioned before when this this uh, video runs don't think some of those animations are just um, you know casual ads they have meaning every animation on this map has meaning for Greyhawk Awakening of course the map is the work of the incomparable Anna B. Meyer um, and we've just added a few animations to it and some of the customizations that have come from uh, Jay Scott's campaign, the Free City of Altamara, many of these forts along the 
uh, province of Ulek and the mountain ranges there all part of the customizations that Jay has created in his ridiculous four decade campaign no, like yeah, the problem is you're not that much older than me. You just been you've been playing consistently, man. <laughs> oh, fam. Good to see you, Phantom. Welcome, sir. Hey, we're we're uh, many of us here are old. That's why I keep all the young people like Evelyn around and Vivi and Josh and like all my players are young. So I said I just. <laughs> <laughs> Juggalo 17 Miller, let's roll! Alright, so that's the Greyhawk Awakening pre-roll. Then last pre-roll before we get started. Dragon Crafting Guild. He's got new stuff coming. He's got lit up uh, dice trays with skulls that glow. Um, amazing stuff. Yes, Tim, I said old, so suck on it. <laughs> hey Tim, good to see you. Yes, Tim's a year younger than me, so he always uh, he always takes advantage of that. Guaranteed to roll more nat twenties, except not really. All right, and with that, we are going to go live. Welcome to Lore Masters Arcanum, episode fifteen. I can't believe we're already fifteen in. <laughs> um, we are because I was doing a regular Wednesday night stream, but I hadn't branded it, and I just branded it. A, you know, a couple. Of, it's like fifteen occurred like that, so I'm not as scared now by your Gabinet Lord's Peaks numbers, Jay, in terms of the the quantity. <laughs> I think I can get there. <laughs> they go by fast. It goes by fast. It goes by really fast. So. I'm joined as always tonight by the amazing Evelyn, my co-star, co-host, um, and a purveyor of all good things on Blue Box. And then, of course, we are joined by the August, um, the absolutely legendary Jay Scott, Lord Gazumba, uh, who has run the most a lengthy, contiguous campaign in D&D history. No one can rival it. No one can question it. Jay, thanks for joining us tonight. Oh, my pleasure to both of you. Thank you for having me on. Uh, this this topic was when you discussed what you wanted to what you wanted to do tonight. It fit, fit right in with both of us. So figured I'd hop on for as long as I can tonight uh, before I gotta do the final preps and uh, we'll have a nice discussion. No, exactly. And that's that's why we started a bit early tonight because I know I have limited time with Jay and I want to squeeze the marrow from the bone uh, with the legend here. But we're really glad to have you with us. And we're talking, of course, the fantastic topic of edition wars tonight. No, no, not edition wars. Just differences. <laughs> <laughs> differences in editions as DMs, as players. Uh, you know, what are really the core differences? And I've got some good questions tonight. Well, good from my perspective anyway, that I want to ask Jay. Um, and then we're very similar, he and I, but we've got a couple of differences that we're going to kind of hone in on as well. And we know this is a popular topic. We got a lot of 5e players out there that are streaming. We got 5e Greyhawk uh, folks that are uh, promoting the community, which we respect and we want that. So, you know, there's no hate here tonight, but there's some real differences in these editions that I think are going to be fun topics. Now, a couple things before we get started with that. One, uh, let's talk about our sponsors. So, as always, uh, we are giving love to Dragon Crafting Guild, uh, the maker of these incredible dice trays. Uh, we had a winner last night. Um, this is one of his newest designs. It doesn't have the light up stuff yet, but you can see, well, look at that, like you can see Evelyn's face glowing in the tray. Um, and so this was a giveaway. Uh, we have Atris Minis that does all our minis. Frederica Valova, uh, who does our incredible uh, artwork for all of our shows. And then last but not least, our newest sponsor, Mantic Games, makers of Terrain Crate, and uh, their stuff is really, really cool, and we're going to be featuring that very, very soon here on Blue Box. Uh, la two last announcements before we get into our content tonight. Reminder, Virtual Greyhawk Con. So Jay, instead of me talking about this, I've got, I've got it up on the screen. I I've, been, I've, been, you know, I've been beating this drum for a few weeks to my audience. Why don't you tell us about great Virtual Greyhawk Con? Virtual Greyhawk Con. It was an idea of mine to get the community together and and a uh, so it's, it's everything's going virtual now we don't need to be in one place 
the technology was there for Roll20, uh, you know, Fantasy Grounds and uh, the, the style you and I play uh, and a lot of other, and with Discord and so let's get the Grail community together in one big event and make it annual and grow the community together. We have 12 Twitch channels participating now. We have 60 events uh, and I believe we have 19 of those sold out. So, and that includes one of yours uh, uh, that had sign-ups. Uh, so, um, there are, I think we're about 50% sold out because of the highlight streams, I wouldn't count those. So we have about 30 events still that have uh, room and there's all sorts of great games from all editions. Uh, you know, you have 5e, you have 3.5, you have old school. Um, there's a lot of great content there. And it's $3.12 to sign up. It's the minimum we could charge on, t on tabletop event site for registration. And then please sign up for the highlight streams too, and it'll put it on your schedule so you won't forget about it. There's a, a there's a click bar set up under uh, community that, show, that shows all the streams. You just click on it, it takes you right to the Twitch channel. We're trying to get it as easy as possible because that's one complaint is in previous um, virtual events is they never they always miss the Twitch broadcasts of those events. So we're trying to, you know, Josh Pop has been really vital and, and Rob Phantom and, and that whole, and Balfron and the whole crew have really helped a lot, uh, made this possible. So uh, thank you. Okay, no. Good. I'm excited, really it, excited. We, we're approaching 150 signups. So that's fantastic. And yeah, so a couple people said you sounded a bit low. Um, and that's probably something with my lineup, but I think you sounded better there. Toward... Be I'm not yelling like I do on Thursday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no, I, I'll, no. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pump, I'll perk up. There, a little there bit. you go. Boom, you got it. Hey, so look, a couple things. So, uh, Greyhawk. Uh, con for Blue Box, we have two streams, one on that Friday, one on that Sunday. The Friday is an open sign up. We've already got that filled, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be a one shot using a module from Carlos Lysing of Castle Entertainment. Um, and it's going to be, he and I have talked several times. It's going to be a fun, fun show. And then our Greyhawk Awakening campaign will be on Sunday. And we have, uh, it'll be a kind of a special confluence of several cool things happening with our cooperation with Gasumba and our whole Greyhawk community. Uh, but then, Jay, before I close off on this virtual Greyhawk Con stuff, can you talk about the all-star event that you have? Because uh, you've got, you got some luminary names. Sure, can I talk about three real quick? Please. So each night we have a, high, um, a main event. Friday night is Anna Meyer, the campaign of Anna B. Meyer, 7 p.m. Eastern, where she shows maps of her own personal campaign. She's never showed anyone, not even me, hasn't showed them. Shield Lands, what she's done with Celine and the, and the Ulrich States and the Horn Society. I mean, it's gonna be awesome that night just to see those custom eyes, uh, you know, campaign maps. Um, that That's that's the highlighted for Friday. Saturday night, um, it's my all-star event game, and I have confirmation. Luke Gygax, Eric Mona, Gary Hooley, and Adam Meyer. <laughs> <laughs> the owner of Troller Games, Stephen Chenault. And everyone knows, and the gentleman who was on Sunday night, the wonderful Chuck Combo. All six of those are playing in the game. Uh, and it'll be my style, old school, just like your group, just like you played, same way. Um, then that's Saturday night, 7 p.m. And then Sunday night, 7 p.m., we finish up the whole show with a special gab and it's going to be SD experts. So right now we have Gary Hulian, um, Len Lakafka, we have Malden, and we have Alan Grodog Grow right now. And you can ask him anything you want about Greyhawk on, on that Sunday night. So plus all the other great, and you'll be right, you'll be going right into that. Your show's from three to seven Sunday, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I think that's right. Eastern. Yeah. It's going to be a fantastic three days. So uh, please uh, sign up and you can sign up for as many highly streams as you want. Please do that. So I know it's a little bit of a a, a bragging rights game there, John. So uh, I, yeah, you know, I got to start. I got to start pushing harder. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, they're all free to sign up for. So Virtual Greyhawk Con, yes. everything is free. Every ticket, every you can sign up for as many as you want. Uh, but some of them, the highlighted streams, have a limited number of viewers available, up to two hundred. So I'm gonna make sure you get in there. And Jay, those are just an obscene roster of uh, folks for your yeah. games. That's incredible. Plus, we are have we have two major sponsors, Reaper Miniatures and Troller Games. They're going to be give, doing giveaways during highlighted streams throughout the entire three days, and it's going to be some really. Oh, I, should, I, I, I would have brought one up. Uh, one of those uh, learn to paint kits. I mean, you know, the ones with the big black box. We're going to be giving a bunch of those out. 
uh, all sorts of all sorts of wonderful things for Troller games, great downloads. So uh, it's going to be it's going to be a fun time. That's fantastic. And hey, good to see you, Steve. Bloodwild. Uh, Bloodwild was the one that helped us get our sponsorship set up with Mantic Games Beautiful. and Terrain Crate, and we're so thankful to him. All right. Great company. Great. Yeah, great company. We're excited about. It. Okay, so let's jump uh, into the last announcement and then into our content. So we talked about this last night. We have a charity stream coming up next week. And this is not a charity stream so that we can grow the channel. This is a charity stream that's coming from a real place of compassion and desire. Uh, it was born in the hearts of uh, me and one of my players, Josh, who plays uh, Brim on our Tuesday Night Greyhawk campaign, uh, to do something to combat child trafficking and many of the travesties that are being committed, not just here in the U.S., but worldwide against children. And this organization, Save the Children, is phenomenal. I've done all the research on their their giving and the the percentages of what goes to them, which actually goes to help children all over the world. Uh, they're doing so much good work, and so next Tuesday night, every dollar that's given, and we're gonna have a charitable sort of direct pass through set up through Twitch, uh, which Evelyn and I are working on, uh, will go straight to save the children, and then also Blue Box uh, will match every dollar, dollar for dollar, send that to them, and then last but not least, Josh is gonna shave that glorious beard on stream. <laughs> and I want everyone to know again, I did not push for that, that he wanted to do that. I would never have asked for it. Uh, it, would, it would be too obvious how jealous I was of the fact that I can't actually grow a decent beard. All right, so <laughs> Jay, uh, let's jump into it. So you have seen an incredible evolution from this. Uh, you know, the original 1E Player's Handbook, uh, the original DM's Guide. I've got, I've got both those here as well. You know, these, these were how you and I both grew up, um, yes. and we learned in these games. And then the game has evolved and grown. And we've identified a few areas today where uh, editions have changed, but I guess maybe the best place for me to start is, why have you stayed true? to the 1E Dragon Magazine uh, uh, rule set and methodology? Well, I'm really not a pure 1E. I'm more 1E than 2E. But I, I say in all my streams, 1E slash 2E. And uh, right. I like a lot of the aspects of 2E. And when it came on, we incorporated as much as we could. So specialty priests, wild mages, uh, but there's aspects of 2e i can't stand like invokers and you know i just uh, i don't i don't like them breaking down mages the way they did they kind of eliminated illusionists and druids uh i cannot stand the 2e bard um so we took all the 2e aspects and made them 1e classes so if that makes any sense um, it does but then when third edition came out it, it changed things drastically was with, with uh prestige classes and multiple could be like four different classes and I'm like this is I just don't want to go there with uh, with with my players my guys are old enough and I always say to you John I always make you laugh they're lucky, <laughs> they're lucky if they remember what they had for lunch that day so um, I just I love the 1e 2e play style we've developed I have 40 character classes and over 40 specialty priests. It just didn't make sense to go there. But we pilfered a lot of third edition. We have our own feat system that's melded in the proficiency system. So we've used a lot of aspects of 3E, uh, third edition. There's a boatload of spells from Relk and Rituals, Sword and Sorcery. We've utilized a lot of that. So I'm not a beyond pilfering stuff into 1E, 2E. But what? I, please don't yell at me, everyone, on this. <laughs> no. I haven't found anything to put in from 5e into my game. So look, the yelling's Fine. the yelling will get started in a little bit. Now, now okay. Bill said Bill said something a minute ago. Bill said, and by the way, you sound okay to me here. So I don't know what, but he said he thought it sounded like your camera mic was picking up your voice and not your headset mic. Is that possible or just? Uh, I, I doubt it, but let me check. It could be possible. Because because you sound uh, good no, to me. It's set, it's set to both. It's yeah. set to both. Okay, yeah. You uh, sound good to me, Evelyn. You sound good to me. Um, okay. All right, so yes, I, I love the first edition Illusionist. So you, you said something that caught my attention there. Tell me why you hate the 2E Bard. They don't do anything. 
They're kind of useless, it's, right? It's you know, the five E bar. I'm going to say this: if the five E bar is better than the two E bar, okay, and the and the third edition bar is better than the second edition bar. Second edition bar looks like an afterthought in the book. It's a thief that can sing, right? So the bard in one E is so momentous in our game because you have to go through seven levels of fighter, eight levels of thief before you even get to bard. Now I've taken bard in first edition and made three different types of bards. Um, so we have, a, you know, we have a druidic base, an illusionist base, and a song bard base. So we've done that, but I just two E bards just didn't, yeah, you know, it just it was a weak, weak class. I think it was just a, a, a throw in, my opinion on that. So no, I think it, it sound really just dropped out. Uh, Bill, can anyone else hear me? I mean, you sound great to me here, Jay. Yeah. So I, I don't know what's what's. Uh, how about uh, Evelyn? Why don't you uh, talk uh, for it? I, now? Uh, Rory says it's perfect now. So. Okay, all right. Okay, all I right. Trust Rory. He's yeah, yeah. Line, Rory, okay. yeah. Rory, Rory's I'm really sorry. good. Sorry, I'm just uh, I'm just talking normally, like I would on any show. So um, I just don't see any. The second E bar is bizarre, um, but um, to each his own, and that's what I wanted to say here. I, my way to playing is not better than your way, John. It's not better than Phantom's way. It's not better. Well, it's better than Tim's way. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, uh, not better than Carlos. Not better than Anna's way. Who plays? She plays Pathfinder. It's it's just play the game. That's the that's the most important thing. Right. No, and I think I think that's ultimately where we'll wind up with any of the conversation. But I did want to mix it up on some of these topics, and uh, let's make sure, Evelyn. Just yes. kind of check mic levels and make sure I'm not the only. So, Evelyn, yeah. what, what are your thoughts or questions or comments here? And let's let you talk for a second. A, because you should. You're great. And then B, <laughs> so people can hear your mic level. Yeah, I mean, uh, as far as additions go, I've only like had really any experience with 3.5. I've looked at 4, and it's garbage, and I hate it. Um, and I'm going to flat out say that. Sorry, guys. If you like four, <laughs> you're wrong. I think you're pretty safe um, there. <laughs> and, um, and 5e is, 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 is it's okay. There's things that work, things that don't work. My, my first experience with like one E play was in our session zero for Greyhawk Awakening with you. So that was really cool. I, I yeah. really enjoyed it. was fun, yeah, right? Trying out. Like, fun. Yeah. I mean, it, it was different. definitely something something very different from from what I had been used to playing so that was a really cool experience excellent well, okay. So look, so I've got so many topics to jump in here. Now I want to just I want to give Jay you I want to give you the option. Um, I've got the Dragon Magazine article for Hero Points up, the Dragon Magazine article for Good Hits and uh, Bad Misses or Critical Hits uh, up. Hey, thank you, Var Severe. We appreciate that, Rory. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Dragon Magazine versus Unearthed Arcana, uh, but then also some of those other topics like, <laughs> like, like backstabbing and sculpting yes. spells. So you, wh why don't you tell us where you'd like to go with the conversation first? Okay. Here's my book for all my rules. Okay. Classes and races. This is, you've ever seen the color coded books behind. Right. So this supersedes anything in any rule book that we have. So within this, I have... Bizarre stuff like recharging costs for wands, right? Um, our entire class's table, all of our proficiencies, right? And then some other bizarre add-ons, changes to classes, um, Dragon Magazine articles. So my players know there's different color-coded books and they go to this point. So this happened, let's talk about the backstabbing, all right? Can you guys hear me? This yeah, you sound great. During... Um, the Living Greyhawk game two Saturdays ago. And I'm, uh, it's because they're not used to my play style, but the cleric thief is out in front of the group looking for traps. And I'm thinking to myself, this is bizarre. Why is, right in the middle of a combat, why is the cleric thief out in the middle? Uh, middle? Why isn't the cleric thief hiding? You know, this is a half and cleric thief. And then a fight ensues, and the cleric thief says, I just move up and around and backstab. And I'm like, out in the open? I'm like, How, how's that happen? I, I, that's the difference between a 3.5 and a 1E, 2E play style. In, our, in a 1E, 2E play style, you have to hide and get out of physical sight. I'm not used to thieves being able to move out in the open and get the, get the flank or backstab attack, especially with missile weapons in 5th edition, which I, I, for life of me is one of the craziest things I've ever seen. So um, that is a huge change i gotta you know i gotta explain to the living great people who are having fun playing hey you gotta go hide in shadows 
you know, that's what the ability is for. You gotta, you gotta duck behind something, and you know. So, John, I don't know if you've had that happen in your game and how you handle that. Well, no. So fortunately, I haven't had that happen because I, you know, I've got a pretty, you know, I've got a pretty set group of players, and most of them I taught. Uh, the game, uh, you know, a few had other experiences, so they got really conditioned to my style of play. But yeah, the, I, honestly, I call myself a core three point five player. But I can tell just from our from our conversations, a few of them, including this one, I've got more one e two e stuff in my in my methodology than I even realize because I the idea of someone coming out into the open and backstabbing in broad daylight or or a backstab from a flank, no, oh, that, that that you've got to be hiding in shadows, you've got to be moving silently, you've got to come up behind, them, you've got to sneak where they don't see you at all to get that backstab multiplier. I've just always played it that way. I didn't realize, and I think that's part of the thing tonight is I'm even more 1E, 2E than I thought I was, uh, but I just, it, I, I guess I never really read that rule in, in 3.5, but I don't like it, and I would never play that way. Uh, it is crazy to me, that, uh, but that's the way they played it, and then, I, see, uh, if anyone knows our Draco, Casey Brown, Casey loves to question every, he's like my Tim in, in, in the Living Greyhawk group, he questions everything I say or do, and he said, well, the math says, why should she ever hide? Because then she's wasting rounds not attacking. And I said, she's a thief. The thief is supposed to go around, sneak up on a mage, and take the mage out. And not attack every round. That's what a fighter does. And I was just like, my gosh, they, the 3.5ers from Living Greyhawk seem, and I'm not bashing them, please. No. I know you <laughs> have to fight for your but they, had, they, had, they, they all min-maxed all the damage each per round in their head. And I think that's what led the fourth edition uh, the, the way it was, you know, it was almost like playing World of Warcraft. Oh, know? okay. So that was, <laughs> sorry, let me cut you off. But that's, that's my huge pet peeve. Um, I talk about this a lot. D and D is not meant to be a CRPG. You know, the, the game should have the balance of, you know, the danger and death should be real. You can't, I mean, okay. One of my biggest beefs with 5e is short rests. Um, mm -hmm. well, well, no, I mean, I shouldn't say it. one of my other big beefs is paladins that could be of any alignment, uh, druids that don't have to be true neutral. Like, I could, I probably got a pretty good list here. Now, what I do like about 5e before I go too deep and, and like, I love the artwork, and I think somebody mentioned earlier some of the modules you can make use of this as a DM, and this is one of my I'm, I'm super flexible as a DM, I can take. Uh, the wheat and separate it from the chaff, and I don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Is that enough uh, idioms for you? So you just this is the idea that you can take great content, great artwork, you know, cool imagery modules, and adapt it uh, for the style of game that you play. But yeah, I'm Jay. I'm I'm 100% with you. <clears throat> That's a great example. Now you said spell sculpting or sculpting of spells. Honestly, when you said that, I don't even know what the heck that is. So, so clearly, I don't honor that in my system either. What is that? Uh, so this happened, and I'm not going to give away any spoilers on the big bed. So myself, Anna, Will, Brian Sublime, and the Nazrat, we all taped our big bad episode, and it's in 5e. And it's like the, only the fourth time I've ever played 5e. And I was playing the mage, and I could literally th throw a fireball in the middle of a combat and not hit any of my companions. And I was like, this is, once again, feels like World of Warcraft to me. Area effect spells in 1E, 2E are going to hit your friends if you do not cast them properly. Mm. If you throw a stinking cloud up, they gotta make the save or they're gonna you know, start puking in the stinking cloud. That is, that is set, I think that's the number one issue I have with 5e is that sculpt, spell sculpting and their effect spells. I, I mean, I, and that is just, it's crazy. Um, well, under, under really changes the dynamic of, of the power of mages and the, them not having to think about what they're casting. No, so, yeah, no, I, I com completely agreed. I mean, yeah, well said. And so uh, we had a comment from in the chat, your reluctant DM, that's a new follower, by the way, he joined us uh, for the first time last night. Yeah. yeah, and um, we appreciate it. So he said he likes paladins that aren't always good. No, I'm fine with that. No, here's the way a paladin should they be. Have to be lawful. Lawful. The whole idea lawful. of a paladin is that they follow a strict ethic code, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have lawful good. That's a true paladin. 
or lawful evil. That's an anti-paladin. Now, I don't really have these, but I, I suppose if you wanted to have um, something in between that was a lawful neutral inquisitor style, I, I, to me, that's still not a paladin. Uh, but I would not get as upset about that. But the idea that paladins can be neutral or chaotic and not lawful, that is in direct contrast that's the entire paladin. principle of a paladin. JJ, I'll let you react to that. So, if you saw last quarter's Earth Journal, I did my Undead Hunter right. subclass of Paladin. And they don't have to be lawful good because of the style of Paladin. They can be neutral good or lawful neutral just because of the play style. I have the Inquisitor, which uh, is supposed to come out this month's Earth Journal. It's based on the Baldur's Gate 2 Inquisitor, which I loved. Uh, lawful good, lawful neutral, lawful evil, but it's campaign specific. Lawful neutral, Fultus, Inquisitor. Yeah. Right? It's a subclass. That, that, that makes sense it's to me. Lawful good paladin, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hextor, lawful evil inquisitor, perfect fit, right? So it's it's in the context of I that I don't have as much of a problem with that as you do in fifth edition, because I understand what they were trying to do with it. But it's truly not a paladin. They should call it something else. Mm -hmm. Like they did, they called it a black guard, didn't they? In, in third and fourth Black edition? Guard, yes, black guard, yeah. yep. Yeah. Now, a chaotic good paladin would not be committed to the ideal of freedom. A chaotic good paladin uh, would not exist. A chaotic good creature, or, or a, pardon me, a PC that's committed to the ideal of freedom would be some other class. You could be a cavalier. Uh, you could be. You, know, you could be a cleric. You could be something else. The crusader. whole. Yeah, crusader. Yeah, great. The whole idea of paladin is you ex you adhere to a strict code. And that, by definition, is not chaotic. It's lawful. Now, look, I don't want to cause any fights or lose any viewers tonight, but that is one of my that is one of my one of my uh, big beasts with it. But I, I, I think those are gro both great topics, Jay. The backstabbing. John, yeah, go ahead. John, real quick, is they, uh, Anna got me on Cursed on Netflix. Okay, the oh. paladins in there are not lawful good. Okay, if you've watched it, I haven't. Watch Cursed. They're as evil as it gets. So, or lawful, neutral, purist. Just watch Cursed, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. So. Yeah. No, I, and I love that. Like, so again, to me, like the lawful evil. That's an anti-paladin. It's still a, sort of like, to me, it's lawful and it's evil. It's a anti-paladin. It's sort of the black guard, right? Lawful, neutral. If you want to argue for that as being sort of, but it's an inquisitor. It's not really a paladin, but. Right. I don't care if you, like, just that lawful, that's the piece I'm sticking to. It, I'm not sticking to the good, neutral, evil. I'm sticking to the lawful. That's part of the paladin class um, in my, all right, I'll shut up now because. No, it's a, I, it's, a good, it's a good point. It's a good point. All right, so talk to us about hero points. And I want to pull this article up. Uh, you referenced it today. And I had not really seen hero points until I watched your campaign. I've got some other things that I use, a couple of my own, like fate chips, which are modifications of other rule sets, uh, but you use hero points, and I think you use them to quite good effect. Um, so talk about that, and I'm going to pull that up while you're talking. Hero points started, and this article goes back to like the late 70s, or if it's from Dragon 39. No, no, that's the uh, that's the crit, the crit one we're talking about. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that and say, yeah, hero yeah. points. Uh, so a hero point system... I always found that save or die situations, and there's a lot of them in 1E2E, are really nasty, especially a large spider at first level can kill you with yeah. one sting. So I wanted to figure out a way to uh, incorporate my players being able to utilize some inner strength as being a hero. They're heroes, right? They should, they should, you know, beyond just a normal saving throw. Right. So hence our hero point system came about, and it's limited to the rule is it's limited to as many hero points as your maximum level. If you're multi-class, whatever that highest level is. Normally, I give them half. When I'm in a really rotten mood, I give them a third or a quarter, right, to start out. Yeah, and I've so, got that uh, highlighted up there on the screen right now. So, you know, that you see that right there. And this was an article by Leonard Carpenter um, originally in this. Do you remember what uh, dragon that's out of? Yeah, this is Dragon 118. Okay. So we had, I think, we, to be honest, I think we had instituted hero points before the article came out. Oh, okay. So uh, I think we started Hero Points. And uh, Bill, uh, Tim, if you're on 90, uh, maybe 80, 87 to 90 is when we implemented it. I um, it could have been even before then. I was experimenting with it a little bit. It just it works for my game. It works for, uh, and they only regenerated certain points. So you should get them for the entire adventure. If it's a series of mega adventures, maybe they regenerate. But they work great in. in Compilation with Twitch, they work even better. They really do. Your system, 
Yeah, they, they really do. That, that's why I use advantage and disadvantage. Uh, it's kind of the same concept, although advantage and disadvantage are more statistically impactful than hero points because hero points, Absolutely. you know, they're only doing one point additional damage or one point additional to hit or you can accumulate, accumulate those uh, with higher. But, you know, advantage, you're automatically sort of doubling your chances. Yeah. Or So I can see where that does influence the campaign uh, more significantly when you use the 5e system. Uh, so we'll come back to that in a second. But one of the questions I want to ask you is, and I've not, I've not seen this on your show, um, but probably because I haven't uh, watched as much as I will be, but you use that for skill checks as well, like they talk about they here, can, 5%. They can use it anywhere they wish. Now, there's a difference between a regular hero point and a special hero point. Uh, the regular hero points are a turn in, what I give them, and then a turn in of 10,000 uh, cheer points that, that you accumulate for watching. A special hero point is every 500 cheer. Right. Uh, especially they can, now the person who makes it over that 500 can assign it or they can give it to me as an anti. Those can be used after a die roll. So that makes sense. Really huge. No, that makes sense. So, so let me ask you about a particular paragraph up here, and I do want to just—I I, I need to do one of your shows. I need like a three-hour session with you, Jay, because uh, I just feel so <laughs> rushed. I have so many things I want to talk sure, to you about. Sure. But uh, occasionally, a player sug will suggest using hero points in a manner that's not easily translated to a die roll modifier. In such an event, the DM must first consider whether the player's request is reasonable. If it is, the DM then make an effort to determine how to convert the hero point to units or time or distance. Have you had situations like that on your show where your players have said, I want to use my hero point for this? Can, can you give us an example? Raised deads. Mm. We had that. I mean, we've had that just kind of very similar to what happened last night. Uh, that situation has, has arisen. Thieving ability checks, that has arisen. Um, where uh, a reaction, uh, the reaction that they're looking for in a discussion with someone and maybe their charisma modifier is not high and they really say, look, I want to throw in a couple of hero points to really get the message across to this individual. I mean, there's a lot of different ways um, that I, I allow use of it. Um, it, it's just it's the creativity on the players. What I don't allow is them to use regular hero points to uh, affect the opponent's die rolls. Ah, okay. Sure. Specials is different. Specials they can turn a critical hit on themselves into a, just a normal hit, or they can turn a you know they can turn a fumble that they got into a, a roll of two and they don't have to roll the fumble table. No, that so. that no that makes a lot of sense. So Evelyn, like if you if you think about that in our game, the way he's describing the use of a special sounds like what in our game? The I mean it's that's. The ability to like sort of like divert a critical hit or yeah, that's the the the, the fate chips. The fate chip, like so the my, my, well, the our minor and our major major fate chips. Yeah, and so that's one of the ways I've kept over much influence because I want the the viewers to be able to influence, but I don't want it to just be like I've seen um, other streams, and I'm not throwing shade where. It's like, oh, you have five healing potions that appear here in the corner of the room. That, to me, breaks immersion and destroys. I, I want the players to influence, but or viewers, pardon me, to influence, but not really divert or control the campaign. The point system that both of us use in different ways is, is not substantive as far as materialistic. So that's why I think it works real well. Mm -hmm. Now... Um, I had a special in a Living Greyhawk campaign where I allowed that to convert into an item someone was looking for in Greyhawk. Kind of, I was like, oh, you want to burn a special, then you found it. You know, I've done that, things like that. But, um, you know, it's just but not like it just magically appears out of nowhere. Um, but, yeah, it's kind of like you're, the inner fight that the, the characters are trying to, uh, you know, be successful with. And uh, it's, you know, how much that they can utilize, so... Yeah, sure. Evelyn, do you have any more thoughts on that? <laughs> Not really. I mean, we've we've uh, like as as you were saying, the the minor and major fate chips are kind of our our way of kind of doing similar things. Uh, our minor fate chips allow us to like, for example, a couple weeks ago when Millie canceled out a critical on a, a shore win um, with that, but like that's kind of the the minor fate chips kind of just limit. Are limited to like make canceling a critical or or being able to re-roll a die. Right. But it doesn't save you. Like if you if you've died, it's you need a major fate chip basically to kind of change that kind of circumstance, and that's uh, very dependent. 
Yeah. No. Yeah. Thank you. No. It's it's well said. And I, I don't know that I've. I think I've seen one major fate chip given out in the entirety of the time my time <laughs> That's playing right. with you, yeah. and I've been playing oh. with you three years now. So yeah, I think we're almost. Yeah. I think it's almost four years, isn't it? Um, uh, it's it's it it will be four in like the spring. Of oh, okay. Spring. All right. So all right. So maybe was, so. I'm not saying it's felt like forever playing with you, but yeah, I just, I just, but no, I think that's so, yeah, I'm, I, those are really rare. And so what I do with my minor and major fate chips, those are purely DM judgment. Um, they, they, they don't come any other way. And it's extraordinary moments of role play, extraordinary moments of combat. And for a major fate chip, which is the rarest of the rare, in all four of the campaigns I run, I've probably given out two or three of them in the last four years. Um, but those are the things which truly can reverse life and death. Now, that's a fantastic segue because Jay only has a couple more minutes before he has to leave. Dragon Magazine 39, good hits and bad misses. I've got it up on the screen here. And uh, this was in 1980, and actually I've got an admission I'm going to make here tonight, which is, um, it was a bit of a revelation for me. I actually remember seeing the he heading of this article and the font, but I don't remember ever reading it uh, as closely as I did today. So Jay, um, talk about like, where this plays into your crit tables. It's the beginning point. Now, every player of mine has something unique they bring. Bill brings crafting. Uh, Tim brings crazy humor and another DM, and Alan brings editing of the fumble and critical hit tables. No. So this is all Alan's doing, and it gets every year or two or five, he goes in and you see it's all color coded. By the way, red is foobar, everyone. You know what that means? <laughs> so, um, uh, and it's based on edge, blunt, thrusting, fumble tables. Uh, there's even a special fumble table for Tim's characters. Oh, really? <laughs> only, yes. yes. Um, he has inco incorporated that as well. Uh, so it's just been, this is a 40-year evolution of the critical hit and fumbles. Uh, kept to a die 100. Yeah. You know, we want yeah. to keep it to that. Percentile so, die, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Um, this has been my most asked for item out of my campaign that people said, can I have a copy? And I, I say, yes, you may. You may. Uh, I, I'm about sharing. I have no problem giving these out because um, they're fun, you know, but they're deadly. Some of them are extremely deadly. You know, Leonard and I get in these fights all the time about it's not supposed to be this way. And I say, well, Leonard, there's spells in second edition that alleviate it, repair injuries in there, dreams in there. Restoration. There's spells that alleviate these, which he's not a fan of, but that's okay. So everyone. Good night, David. The by end. the way, David's heading David, out to the. <laughs> he's it's randomized, so a uh, hundred's not bad. It used to be you rolled high and you knew you, trouble was coming, so it, they're randomized on. on the and and Tim said they're not fair. Yeah, Tim's are way worse. <laughs> Tim's more <laughs> play crits are way worse. So uh, yeah, absolutely. They're 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 sicker than both of yours and mine um absolutely so like this is a good a good place for us to part me i, I just like because i know you got to go but man yeah i just want to talk to you so much more tip but the the, iceberg. Tip i have a tip of the tip, but tip of the tip but i have i have an admission here uh because i was i i have always felt quite um i don't know maybe elitist I love my Middle Earth role playing Iron Crown crit tables. I talk about awesome. these all they they are awesome, but uh, I thought they were to I thought they were totally original. And when I looked at this article more closely today, they're very similar. Like it's clear that Ice ganked a lot of these ideas uh, with the severances and the percentile dice rolls. So these Iron Crown tables, these are all percentile. Now some of them are more more narrative you know so they've got descriptions some of them are funny some of them are kind of silly but it's it's really the same idea you got your blunt your your slashing your puncture your crush um but last question i want to ask you sure because i'm actually evaluating this right now for my own campaign how if at all do you use crits as it relates to spells now that might not make sense as it comes to like a basic dc but what if you got a targeted spell or you know something where they make a range attack and they roll a nat 20. Do you have anything in your campaigns that recognizes that, hey, it could suck as bad to take a, a, a ray of fire through the eyeball as it would to take a dagger through the eyeball? So the answer to that is only in the case where it, uh, the attack is a physical attack with a Mel arrow or the arrow. Right. Part, because 
the proverbial can of worms gets opened up with my guys, and then I can't I can't do that with spell crits. It just it would go it would get too big. Uh, now Tim is incorporating it into his adventure. Yeah, he so said he's got energy and fire crits. Yeah, he does. For me, I don't want to go to that next level at this point in our gameplay. Um, it's something interesting, but. It really throws a wrench in when you're talking about a, a tenth of a mage, a bad guy throwing a fireball out there, and he crits with it, and you can have a party wipe pretty easily, mm. right? So there's a lot of things there. I say leave spells the way they are. No, I look, and I no, I, and I look. I, by the way, uh, the last thing in the world I'm trying to do is influence you. Uh, I, you know, uh, I, as as I think it was uh, Grenda Wolf said, I'm not ganking anything from you. I'm paying homage. Um, <laughs> that's a good you know, but, but that that's how I've separated. Like when you're rolling. Um, the one thing I did think about with basic uh, DC spells, you know, things where like a fire, because fireball is not a range attack. You're not rolling a D20 on your fireball. Right. Your enemy is making a saving throw. Now, the one thing I thought about doing, and I may add this to my campaigns, is what if you roll a one on that saving throw? Uh, th then, then it's not about each, it's not, it's not all four of the enemies, but if one of the enemies rolls a one, maybe he got that fireball in the throat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it really impacted him. That to me seems kind of a fun wrinkle to the game, but I haven't implemented it yet. So it, it may be fun, but when when you have certain characters that need a two or three on a save with all the pluses they have at higher level, and they roll a one, the only way they can fail is a one. Then right. you know, it's it's tough. It's it's, it's a bad oh, thing. that's a good point. Yeah. So I got a so higher level character, and really he could have saved with a two, but because he rolled a one. He's don't, getting. Don't a, put it down. More for me to track, and I'm tracking almost a lot of other things. Yeah. But play testing when you when you bring out something, play test it. Yeah. No, I, I like that. Your Sunday group, not your not your Tuesday night. <laughs> yeah. <group. laughs> no. But 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 I think that's you know that was that was kind of the point here. Like this this article was published in 1980. Right. This didn't yeah. exist before, but it became canon. It's acceptable in everybody's campaigns. And if you and I come up with something, it can be equally acceptable. Hey, look, we got to let Jay go, but man, I am. So first of all, thank you, thank you, thank oh, you, this is great. thank you. Do this again. We'll do. We'll, we'll we'll figure something out. Maybe come on an hour or two earlier. Or yeah, we'll we'll do something a little bit longer next time uh, for sure. But thank you, Jay Scott. Well, incredible. I will be changing my shirt between shows. That's how crazy I am. So uh, thank and, you so very much, Ellen. Thank you for uh, having me on too. And the only reason I'm not wearing your shirt is because it's in the wash. I told you that. So No problem. See us right. in uh, 25 minutes. Uh, uh, Legends of Lore, Circle of Eight, and other great spellcasters tonight. It's going to be a great show. And, oh, thank you, uh, Anna. And, yes, you guys don't have to leave. We're going to raid Jay here in just a few minutes. We always yeah. go straight into his show. So thank Runner's you. probably waiting on Zoom. So I better <laughs> All right. See you, Jay. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Oh, hey, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate that. So just a couple thoughts I wanted to jump into. So, yeah, that was that really blew me away when I saw this because, you know, the Middle Earth Iron Crown stuff, that was that was on the back of the Dragon magazines throughout the 80s, but these oh. these crits and hits were we up early. fix our views. Uh, yeah, I know. Okay, hang on here. I've got, I've, I've got one here. <laughs> Boom, look at that. I actually know, look like oh, when I know what I'm doing. One touch. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Bill. And Bill, look, I want to say also, we're so excited about, I know you've got uh, some, some cool stuff that you're working on, and you've got a little bit of it you're going to send to us, and uh, we are very, very appreciative of that. All right, so last couple things I wanted to talk about. I mentioned this earlier. I love these Middle Earth crit tables, and I'm going to actually show, I know many of you have seen these, but there might be a few that haven't. Um, and let me pull that up here on the screen. So this is the GM screen uh, from the 80s. You know, and it sounds like, Tim, what you're doing, you mentioned Arms Law, uh, I think, uh, in your comment. That's obviously the, uh, the Lore Master stuff, which was, uh, yeah, you said unarmed and claw crits. That sounds like it's really a lot of what this is. Now, it uses percentile dice, but this old DM screen it has, so Phantom's using Homebrew for 5e Greyhawk, uh, John Blocks, you know, and look, and I think that's really where, <laughs> you guys are crazy, that's really where a lot of this comes from, like, I, I like to put, hey, thank you, Redbeard, we appreciate the cheers, sir, um, Captain Redbeard, one of our longtime viewers, uh, but like, this is such a fun, Google the uh, original Iron Crown Enterprises or Middle Earth Role Playing DM screen. Um, it's got gorgeous stuff. There's cool artwork. You know, you've got the original Mirkwood modules um, in there. But then 
uh, Shelob, and then the tables. And this is where you see why the, the system failed, uh, because it was so freaking complex. Um, and I, I would, I'm not saying that anyone, unless you've got some super hardcore players that really want to dive into deep statistical uh, stuff, this is probably not the system for you. But if you want to adapt some of it to a D&D &D campaign, and that's what I've done, it's a great system to adapt. So you've got your different weapon attacks. I don't use any of these charts. Um, let me go to the ones I actually use. And missile, so it divides everything. Grappling. I mean, look at all, look at all these rolls. Look at all these statistics. I mean, this is they were they were seriously statistical. Um, you got action tables, fumble tables, animalistic tables. Now let me get down here. This is what I really wanted to show. So here's an example of how I'm going to start using spell crits. Um, so you've got heat, cold, electricity, and impact critical tables. So heat, cold, and electricity can all be used for spells. Fireball, cone of cold. Um, you've got a, a lightning bolt that hits. And let's say they fumble with a one, uh, then you could use these crit tables. And so these make a... I, I, I do think it's fair that mages have the opportunity to have that serious impact uh, in the way a fighter might with a critical strike on a blade or a, a bow. So things like, look at 87 to 89, and these are, these are not randomized. They do accelerate as you get higher in the numbers. They get nastier and nastier, but they include great narratives. Sorry, Evelyn, go ahead. No, I was gonna say yeah, they definitely get the nastier as you go up, and and the I remember the things that have doubles tend to, or there are certain ones that have special things about them depending on what numbers they are. Yeah, I guess that's a little bit of rent. So like the number eighty is particularly bad. Uh, you know, it's just sticking there in the middle. <laughs> but like, if you get an eighty on that on an electrical table, strike to side devastates nervous system, severe shock, victim victim is a living vegetable for one month. <laughs> Um, or if it's on the heat side, uh, fire blast ahead, face horribly scarred, knocked out, plus 15 hits, five hits per round, if no helm, helm in a one month coma. Um, these things are serious crits. And then they actually accelerate beyond 100, even though it's percentile dice. And Evelyn, I know you've heard me say this before, so they hear another voice. How, how, so I don't use how they did it. Um, right. They had but how you do it. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so they had A, B, C, D, E criticals. To me, it gets super complicated. I think I have a pretty simple system. Mm -hmm. uh, tell everybody how I do this. So basically, like, you, it, for any confirmed critical, just for a base confirmed critical, it's one to one hundred percent. But if you roll a nineteen on the die, it's plus 10 to that percentage roll, and if it's a natural 20 on the, the confirmation, it's plus 20 on that percentage. So you can get up to 120%, basically. Yeah, so statistically, that's a 1 in 400 chance, right? You gotta roll a 20 on the crit, you gotta roll a 20 on the confirmation, both nats. If you do that, you add 20 to that crit roll. So it yep. makes these crits, they are, they are serious. Like players, you've seen some of my, I probably should have grabbed a video, when you have crits in my campaigns, you'll literally have the entire table go, ah! uh, because they, they, yep. they know this is potentially so impactful. And when they fumble, uh, they're, they're really, really worried. Uh, and so it's a great addition to the drama of the game. And I've always felt this, and this is the last thing I'll say on this. So Moose, you said we change it only to stun, kill, or no effect. Yeah, and look, you gotta roll with what you like as a DM. Uh, for me, I like the players being worried, um, frightened of death. And that's why I use the fate chips to offset a bit. But I've always said this. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I'm not looking for hyper-realism. And by the way, I don't think uh, Tim's probably already switched over. But I know uh, Tim uh, is one who is super into hyper-realism. He does um, actual like topography uh, charting and distances of, of, of throws and arrows by angles and he is very very serious about realism. I don't take it to that degree but it's never made sense to me that you could be in a fight and you could just get whacked over and over and over and over and over again with a sword but because you have 125 hit points or whatever you're not worried uh, until the like, ninth time that you're hit by that sword. 
that doesn't feel anything close to combat. Even with heroes, I think the danger that you could suddenly, even if you have 150 hit points, uh, you could take a sword through the ear, you know, and out the other side of your ear, that can happen, and that should be part of the game. Now, I don't want to lose my players too often, so that's why I counterbalance uh, with the with the uh, fate chips. So, I don't know. It's some thoughts. Let me look at the chat here, and Evelyn, any comments you have on that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's an important thing. It's like, as, at least from the player standpoint, you know, I... <sighs> I have never been particularly fond of the standard Dungeons and Dragons critical system. Well, you you crit, so you just do double damage or, or triple damage. You know, there's other feats, at least in 3.5, that kind of allows a similar thing, like Vital Strike and, the, and that sort of thing. So I like actually having the the these critical and fumble tables because it, it actually makes when you get that it's much more satisfying because of how impactful it is either way i mean like it's very stressful to f like confirm a fumble on these tables. <laughs> it's very stressful because then it like comes down to your percentage dice and you're just like let me roll low please let me roll low. yeah yeah like they, they exactly you know well said and so you've got <laughs> hand arm fumble missile weapon fumbles you've got spell failure tables so let's say for example whether it's a wild magic surge or maybe you're casting a spell and you take a hit and you fail your concentration check so that wizard you know he gets an arrow in the neck right as he's casting and he fails a spell could that potentially create a fumbled spell of uh, a fumbled spell you have moving maneuver t uh, fumble tables so if they're attempting to leap over that bridge or walk over that slick terrain and they fumble on that uh, all kinds of things that you can use here and this to me i'm not espousing this as something that others should necessarily use i think it comes back I think it really comes, so uh, Phantom said, because Orenoir just said it was conceptually incompatible. What was he responding? Phantom said, the problem with realism is it hit points. So, no, I, so that's, I, it doesn't, but you can make it work. That's, that's, that's kind of what I think I've done here, and it, maybe you disagree. That's, that's the beautiful thing of the game. We all have our own styles. But I like hit points, and normal combat, maybe that fighter, well, no, not maybe, that fighter should be able to take more sword blows and more arrows. But it doesn't change the fact that he could get hit in a vital area. Uh, he could get struck with something which is devastating. And just doing a 2x or 3x, um, as you have on your most of your critical systems, to me does not react, re, uh, reflect the reality of the deadliness of combat. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I think these are these are fun. My players like them. They don't they don't despise them. Um, and because I do have these little wrinkles like fate chips, they they usually will work out more in the player favor favor than they will in the enemy favor. Uh, but like we've had a couple of glorious episodes. I, the one that stands out to me, Evelyn, uh, you remember when uh, Jordan's half orc uh, yeah. Azimir. Uh, he was fighting this huge, it, it was the BBEG of the whole session, and he rolled like a nat 20, he confirmed with a nat 20, and then he rolled a 100 on the crit, yeah. which is a 1 in 4,000 roll. So you roll a 1 in 4,000 roll, I think, as I remember it, he slid underneath the orc, he severed him in twain from the growing up as he emerged from the other side. It was like this glorious one-shot kill combat maneuver, which has the whole table erupting. It's not, it's, it's, it's not cheap, it's not a throwaway, because it happens so, so rarely. But just the fact that it can happen... Well, and the danger of the situation that we were in at the time, too. Like, we were this little party completely surrounded by orcs in Middle-earth. And that is a very stressful place to be when you're an elf and a few humans, a hobbit, and a half-orc. So, <laughs> like, that was... It, there was just so much like emotion behind it because there was so much danger just from the place we were in first of all and the the the, the complete like sheer awe of that kill would just added to that like it was just like because you, you're sitting there as another player at the table going how are we going to get out of this situation <laughs> yeah exactly all right so uh i'm going to close off here because we're going to raid jay but i want to talk about what tim said and evelyn if you want to look at the chat and tell me if there's anything else you think we should address before we go 
But Tim, I like the fact you slide yeah. the crits based on fighter skill differences. That's very similar to what Iron Crown was doing with these A, B, C, D, E criticals. They would slide them up or down by 20 points. So it could be a 40 point swing based on things like size and uh, weapon type and armor. Like, so they had very similar modifications of the criticals. Um, and it sounds like that's what you're doing with your system. A 13th level of Cavalier kills them ugly. A third level fighter does plus four. You know, I actually, I like that a lot too. Um, now, again, Tim, so let me ask you this before we close off. You're, you're a big realism guy. Let's be honest. A 15-year-old kid could get lucky with a sword and put it through your eye and kill you. Uh, now, I understand why you're scaling because I think you're balancing realism versus sort of the, the mechanics of the game. But why is it that a fourth level fighter could not have a critical that would actually kill someone in one shot? Uh, because that to me would seem, at least as I understand, you and I have not talked about it, it's more what I've heard from Jay, that that could be a one shot kill. And while he's waiting to respond, Evelyn. I was going to say, and, and armor has weaknesses. There are the points that any, like, <laughs> even to a fully plated, you know, uh, fighter. Their armor has weaknesses. They have connection points. There are places where a blade or a spell can slip through, no matter how well armored you are. So it makes total sense to me that even if you're like the beefiest of beefy like fighters, or you know, everybody has a weakness, and sometimes you just get lucky and you find that weakness. No, I think that's that's exactly right. So we're gonna go ahead and set up to raid Jay here. Uh, let me pull this down so you guys aren't staring that. And I want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, before we raid Jay, um, a big thanks to the chat. I didn't even show my Unearthed Arcana uh, book. I want to talk to Jay about that tonight, so we're going to save that for next time. Uh, but you guys are fantastic. We love the chat. And it, I'm not seeing Jay up yet. Let me try again. Yeah, he, just, he just went live for me. I saw him. Okay. I, don't I got know. the notification. I don't know. For some reason, my I think shows a bit late. But... Uh, while we're waiting, there we go. Um, if you have not given us a follow yet, first of all, we want to say thank you for the chat. You guys are the best. Thank you for the cheers, Redbeard. Um, but if you haven't given us a follow, please give Blue Box a follow. Uh, we're growing. We're going to get 600 here in just a couple of days, and we were just at 200 three months ago. So we're a fast-growing channel. We are so thankful to the Greyhawk community. Uh, we're so thankful to Lord Gasumba and all of the, the folks that are helping us grow. I can't even begin to name... Connor McGregor has a greater chance of critting me versus... No, a greater chance. Yes, Tim, I agree. But duh, you have some chance to crit, right? Are you saying if that, that fourth level Cavalier has no chance to do anything more than plus four damage, he could not put a sword through your eye if he's fourth level? Is that what you're saying? I, I really want to know before I raid. <laughs> he's got me curious. He's probably already gone, but oh, we were five, four. Okay, yeah. So that's interesting. We let, let's uh, let's debate that a bit more, no. friends. <laughs> yeah, let's debate that a bit more, my friend. Thank you, Orianoir. I love me some viewers. You guys are the best. We are starting our Lord Gazumba raid. Uh, we have nine, eight, seven, six. Five, four, three, two, one. Rating J. Blue box out. We'll see you Sunday. And, and let's see. We rated with 21.